So our next discussion is on a laboratory characterization of a bituminous mixtures. We know that the fatigue damage in a pavement occurs due to repeated loading. So how many loads of repetitions we need to apply to simulate the fatigue damage in a mixtures? So if you look into the picture which is given here, you can see the x scale of a picture to be a logarithmic of n, where n is the number of repetitions of a standard axial load and y scale is a logarithmic of strain, logarithmic of strain. So now if you see the fatigue damage occurs when you subject the payment or when you subject the bituminous mixtures over a wide uh, or a bigger, a bigger number of n. Now if you compare a fatigue damage and the rutting, rutting happens at the initial stage of a payment that is when the n value is low. So, and the fatigue damage occurs at the end of the payment when the n value is high. You can also study the linear and the nonlinear response of a bituminous mixtures from this. So if you look into this linear response of a bituminous mixtures, if you want to study the property of a linear uh, viscoelastic uh, uh, behavior, now you need to subject the bituminous mixtures to a very small strain very small strain and we do not need to apply too many repetitions for this uh, characteristics uh, to study this characteristics behavior. For example, if our aim is to determine the modulus, dynamic modulus or resilient modulus of a mixture, it is sufficient enough if you subject the bituminous mixture to a, a few number of repetitions of a load. And the same, the same behavior if you want to study in a nonlinear range or if you want to study the nonlinear behavior of a bitumen, we can apply a larger strain. You have to apply a larger strain or you have to extend your limit further from the linear limit to study the nonlinear behavior. So now here, if you want to simulate the fatty characteristics of a bituminous mixture, we need to subject the bituminous mixture sample to a long, uh, to a larger number of repetitions of an axial load. We also have to differentiate between permanent deformation in a material and the fatigue damage that happens in a material. So if you take an example, if you see a, a figure here, so the x scale is strain and y scale is stress. So if you, this stress strain plot for a permanent deformation, this will get displaced. So this figure can be understood by separately plotting a stress time plot and a strain time plot. Let us subject this sample to a continuous loading. Uh, maybe I have a sign loading something like this. The amplitude, this is sigma naught. Now, for a viscoelastic material, we know that there will be a lag in the stress and strain, and at the end of a one cycle of loading, the strain in the material will not completely recover, will not completely recover, and there will be a permanent or irreversible deformations. So when you apply this repeated loading, this permanent irreversible deformation build over a, P, over a number of cycles of loading and the deformation curve looks something like this. So now if you plot a stress strain diagram for this cache, you can see a Lisa juice plot or a stress strain diagram will show a permanent deformation or a irreversible deformations which is happening here. And this is this being an irreversible deformation, this grows as you do a repeated loading on the mixture. So this permanent deformation has to be differentiated from the fatigue damage when you simulate 
the fatigue damage in the laboratory. So fatigue damage, if you see the x scale again, this is a strain and the y scale is stress. So we apply a tension compression loading. Why tension compression? We will see it little later why it is tension compression. So when you apply a tension compression loading, the, we have seen already the Lisa juice plot for a viscoelastic material is ellipse. So if there is no permanent deformation, if you, ex if you ignore this permanent deformation here in the material, so the the, as the damage progresses, there will be a disorientation. disorientation in this Lisa juice plot. So you can see a disorientation in the Lisa juice plot. The, uh, this, uh, this disoriented Lisa juice plot can be an ellipse or if the damage is more, it can take even a, it can even be a non-elliptical. So now if you want to simulate the fatigue damage in a bituminous mixtures, you have to know uh, when does a permanent deformation occurs or when does a fatigue damage occurs? You have to give a loading in such a way that there should not be any permanent deformation in a material and we have to focus only on the fatigue characterizations. So fatigue characterization of a bituminous mixtures in a laboratory, it depends on as we saw before, it depends on the type of loading or a method of testing. It also depends on whether we apply a sinusoidal load or a have a sign load. Whether we can also test it either in a load controlled uh, mode or in a deformation controlled mode. It was also proved that this fatigue life of a bituminous mixtures in the laboratory is, depends on the frequency of testing and uh, no doubt that uh, material behavior changes with the test temperature and the rest period uh, between two loading cycles. Now we will see one by one how these factors affects the fatigue life of bituminous mixtures. Benedetto et al listed various modes of testing that was used to characterize the fatigue damage in the laboratory. So if you uh, look into this uh, different uh, geometry used in the characterizing the fatigue damage, in the first one a cylindrical sample is subjected to a tension compression loading. So a cylindrical sample of height h is subjected to a tension compression loading and again we should not forget that it is a repeated loading. So uh, maybe this is tension and the other is compression. So we apply a repeated tension compression loading. Tension compression loading and find the property dynamic modulus. Estimate the fatigue life based on the way, based on the uh, change in the dynamic modulus as the damage progresses. So this is one of the geometry used, which is a cylindrical geometry, is subjected to the tension compression mode. The common test used in the fatigue uh, fatigue characterization of a bituminous mixtures is a beam bending test. So we have here two point beam bending test, three point beam bending and a four point beam bending test. So in a two point beam bending test, a beam sample, trapezoidal beam sample is subjected to a load so that the sample fails in a cantilever action. So you can see a loading of a sample at the end of a beam. So this load, this loading and unloading happens repeatedly. You can observe a failure in a uh, failure of the beam in the cantilever actions. So top will be in tension and the bottom will be in compression. So the failure will be something like a crack starts from the top and progresses towards bottom. This three point beam bending test and the four point beam bending test, a, a simple beam bending test, uh, the main difference between these two is uh, four point beam bending test is a pure bending test where the shear force is zero at 
the center of loading. For example, if you construct a shear force diagram for this, you will see shear force diagram. So, the reaction will be here P by 2 and here the reaction will be P by 2 for the load of P by 2 and P by 2 here. So, the shear force diagram will look something like this. So, the shear force is 0 and the sample is subjected to a pure bending at this point. So, it is a the sample being subjected to a pure bending. So, you apply a repeated loading here, repeated uh, sinusoidal have a sin, sinusoidal or a have a sign loading. So, the crack starts from the bottom. If a bottom is in tension, the crack starts from the bottom and propagates to the top. The uh, next mode of testing is an indirect uh, tensile strength test in which the cylindrical sample is subjected to a diametrical loading. So, this is a biaxial testing. So, in this biaxial testing, so we apply a repeated load here and uh, measure a horizontal deformation, the deformation in the horizontal plane. So, when you apply a repeated loading, you can see the sample, you will observe a sample cracking along this plane and uh, we uh, calculate the fatigue life based on the extent of cracking that we will see it little later how to post process the experimental data to determine the fatigue life of the payment. So, now these four tests, first four tests can be a, uh, can be conducted in a strain control mode or stress control mode. Whereas, this IDT test, we know that it will be only a stress control mode test. And now, the next question is, we have too many geometry here. Will the fatigue life depends upon the geometry we use? Let us see that. Now, here is an example, uh, example graph as given by Benedetto et al. The x scale here is the strain and y scale here is just a different mode of testing. So, you have different mode of testing, mode used for testing. So, Benedetto et al conducted a fatigue testing using tension compression mode, 2 point beam bending test, 4 point beam bending test and indirect tensile stress and calculated the fatigue life for different strain levels. The fatigue life is expected to vary as the strain uh, changes. At lower strain level, we will have a higher fatigue life and as the strain increases, the fatigue life will fall drastically. So, he calculated the fatigue life for a different strain level and estimated the strain corresponding to a fatigue life of 1 million. 10 power 6, 1 million standard axles. Now, if you see this, the strain corresponding to 1 million fatigue life for tension compression mode for two samples lies somewhere between 90 and 110. For two point beam bending test, maybe 130 micro strain to 150 micro strain, four point beam bending stress the value is little higher and the value varies from nearing 130 to all the way nearing 170 plus. So, all these three tests as we said before, these tests are a strain control test and indirect tensile strength test is a stress control test. Now, you can see the difference. So, the mode we select for testing is of a great importance and the fatigue life varies with the mode of testing used. The next input which we have to give is like a pattern of loading, whether we apply a 
have a sign loading or a sinusoidal loading. We know that the traffic uh, condition is simulated using either a sinusoidal or a have a sign loading. So, in a sinusoidal loading, if say for instance, if it is a strain control test, the deflection varies from 0 and go all the way to the maximum. Maybe this is a tension maximum, come back to 0 and goes to the compression maximum and then go back to 0. So, this is one cycle of loading. So, we apply a repeated sinusoidal loading and calculate if we control a deflection, find out what is the stress response and calculate the fatigue life of the bituminous mixtures. In case if it is an have a sign loading, so it is, way, it, it is only a tension loading varying from 0 to maximum and then goes to 0 in a half sign pattern. So you can see this half sign pattern of loading in case of an have a sign loading. So, we either use a sinusoidal uh, waveform or a have a sign load waveform for determining the fatigue life of a bituminous mixtures. Now, if you see the results uh, uh, here, the y scale, x scale here is time in seconds and we have two y scale, one is force and other is deflection. In a deflection control or a strain control test, Assume like we are applying a sinusoidal strain, same thing like this, a sinusoidal strain, uh, the red color one which is sinusoidal in nature. Now, you can see the maximum uh, deflection on the tension side and the maximum deflection on the compression side to be equal. So, the resultant force output will also be a sinusoidal. So, the resultant force output which is marked here in a blue is also a sinusoidal. So, this is in case if you apply a sinusoidal deflection, the force resultant force will also be sinusoidal. The only difference is that uh, force leads the deflection value and we know that this is uh, this time function or the lead is defined as a phase, phase, phase angle or a time time lag. In case of a have a sign loading, if you control the deflection in a have a sign pattern as shown here in the red color uh, waveform, you can see that the force output over a period of time becomes a from a have a sign to sinusoidal. So, input is have a sign, deflection input is have a sign. So, we control the deformation in a have a sign pattern. The output response is which is uh, stress response or a load response here is sinusoidal. So, this is the thing you have to keep in mind when you apply a have a sign function, the output function, have a sign deformation, the output uh, stress function will not be a have a sign, it will be a sinusoidal. The next factors that controls the fatigue characterization of a bituminous mixture is whether we conduct a stress control test or a strain control test. So, in a strain control test, we keep the strain amplitude to be constant. So, as shown here, if you see a y scale it is strain and x scale is a time. So, uh, we apply a repeated sinusoidal load as per this figure it is a repeated sinusoidal load. So, tension compression sinusoidal load. The deformation or the peak amplitude if you represent by epsilon naught, the epsilon naught value or the magnitude of epsilon naught remains constant over uh, cycles. Now, the response for this will be due to initial at the initial cycles of a loading before the damage starts, you may see the sigma naught to be constant, but as the damage progresses for the strain response of epsilon naught, the stress, uh, stress magnitude decreases. You can see initially it is constant and over a repeated loading, uh, 
the sigma naught decreases. So this will be the response you will get when you control a strain. If you control a stress by applying a load, assume like we control a stress and the magnitude of stress remain constant and let us take that to be sigma naught. So at the initial cycles of loading, the strain value remains constant and as the damage accumulates, as the damage progress, what will happen is for the same, st the strain increases, strain amplitude increases. You can see that initially it is constant and as the damage increases, it will reach the, it, it will reach a maximum value or it increases, strain increases. So this is the pattern you will get when you do a, a stress control test. Now we have to be careful when we when we conduct a stress control test in a, for a viscoelastic material. The, if, uh, one example here is highlighted. Now if you look into this graph, this is a, st a stress control test where we control the stress in a Haversine pattern. So let this peak be sigma naught. So when you control a stress in a Haversine pattern, the resultant strain will also be Haversine, but they are due to a stress strain lag and uh, we are also loading it continuously without giving any rest period between each cycles. So due to this, there will be a, uh, there will be unrecovered strain at the end of each cycle. As this unrecovered strain at the end of each cycle increases, you will get the strain plot to be something uh, like in the increasing, uh, increasing strain magnitude. So you will see unrecovered strain. You see unrecovered strain increasing as you load continuously. So this is what uh, so this unrecovered strain, we call it as a, a permanent deformation in a material. So we use this type of a, uh, loading conditions for characterizing a rutting response of a material. So in this conditions, we say that the fatigue damage as a hidden damage. So the fatigue damage may be hidden in this case. So we have to select uh, appropriate loading conditions to characterize the fatigue damage of a bituminous mixtures. So here is a uh, table that compares the stress control testing and the strain control testing of a bituminous mixture. So this table was consolidated by Tangila et al. So when you see the factors, so they have listed a various factors. The first one is failure of a specimen. So in a stress control test, you see a well defined fracture at the end of the test and in a strain control test there is no clear fracture of observed. Let us focus only on a few important points here and the flexural stiffness a modulus value computed, uh, computed for a repeated loading flexural stiffness. If you see this flexural stiffness you have a higher stiffness and due to this higher stiffness, you also see an increased fatigue life. And in a strain control test, you get the lower stiffness. Please note that the stiffness values are not same in a stress control and the strain control test. So, and this lower stiffness will result in increased fatigue life. Higher stiffness sample or a high stiff sample will increase in a fatigue, increase to fatigue life when you conduct a stress control test. Low stiff sample will result in an increase to fatigue life when you control a strain control test. So fatigue life calculated using stress control test is low and the strain control test is high. Another important uh, factor here is energy dissipations. So energy dissipations increases during the test and this is increases, decreases during the test. So if you 
conduct a stress control test and if you calculate the energy dissipation for uh, different cycles and if you plot it, you will see an increase in energy dissipation in case if it is a stress control test. If it is a strain control test, you will see a decrease in energy dissipation, decrease in energy dissipation if it is a strain control test. And this increase and decrease has occurs at a different rate. So, the rate of energy dissipation is rapid in rate of increase in energy dissipation is rapid in stress control test and it is slow at the slow when you conduct a strain control test. And this is another important point when you give a rest period between a load cycle. So, a rest period is found to be more beneficial or you get a more number of uh, n value will be greater when you provide a rest period. The same rest period if you provide in a strain control test, you will see it to be relatively less beneficial. So, what is rest period and how it is beneficial, uh, we will see it little later in this presentation. Another factor here is the frequency. The fatigue life NF, which is number of repetitions of uh, uh, number of repetitions of load depends on the frequency of testing here this frequency we generally use is 10 hertz this 10 hertz frequency is expected to simulate a traffic of 80 km per hour speed and the fatigue life also depends on the temperature ASTM specifies a temperature for conducting a fatigue life of a bituminous mixtures. Generally, this uh, fatigue life occurs in the temperature, critical temperature will be 20 degrees Celsius, but different standard recommends different temperature in the region of minus 10 to 20 degrees Celsius. Let us see the standard specifications little later in this presentation. So, we have discussed uh, about the rest period. Now, we will see how the rest period influences the fatigue characteristics of the bituminous mixtures. Generally, we apply a continuous loading as shown here for, uh, for finding out the fatigue life of a bituminous mixtures. But in a real time conditions, if you see or if you want to simulate the real time conditions in the laboratory, we need to find out what is an axial load of a vehicle and for given equivalent uh, loading conditions in the laboratory and we also have to consider the speed of a vehicle and use the, the corresponding frequency when you test the material in the laboratory and one more very important factor is a time gap between two loading conditions which we call it as a time headway. So, now we should know what is the time headway. Now, check whether are we, uh, now we need to uh, think whether we are simulating the same conditions by giving a continuous loading. So, now uh, to simulate or to give the gap between a two load, we introduce a rest period between a two loading cycles. So, when you see a rest period uh, between a two loading cycles, it is introduced in a two pattern. One is after each load, give a rest period. So, after each load, give a rest period. So, this loading may be for corresponding to 10 hertz frequency. 0.1 seconds and the rest time will be 1 seconds or 0.9 seconds. The another pattern of introducing a rest period between a load cycle is apply a continuous cycles of loading and then give a rest period and then apply a continuous cycles of loading then rest period. So, do a repeated loading like this till you attain a failure stage. So, why do we need a rest period? while simulating the fatigue behavior. See, we know that this viscoelastic material exhibits the strain recovery during rest. And also, you can see a stress relaxation behavior when you give a rest, rest period between a two loading cycles. Another important characteristics of this viscoelastic material is the healing characteristics of the material. 
So the damage that occurs over a period or due to continuous loading, if you give a rest period, may heal and the, uh, it can, the material may recover to its original conditions. So this important healing property will increase the fatigue characteristics of the bituminous mixtures. So if you want to simulate the real time traffic conditions, test it with the rest period. So another thing is if you want to simulate the multi axial loading conditions. So if you see this front axle is a single tire, dual, middle axle is a tandem axle and a tridem axle. So uh, single axle waveform may be like this, tandem axle waveform and a tridem axle waveform like this. So this are a, some sample waveform, we use it to, uh, to, to simulate the real time traffic conditions. So now we will focus more into a fatigue damage simulation using a 4 point beam bending test. Let us hold here for a while. And in the next lecture, we will see a 4 point beam bending test and the indirect tensile strength test to determine the fatigue characteristics of a bituminous mixture. Thank you.